Good evening and welcome to our webinar, Finding Strengths in the Struggle, Building Resilience with Tourette Syndrome. My name is Angela Sullivan, Medical Project Specialist, and I will be your moderator for this evening. This webinar is being provided as part of the Tourette Health and Education Program, a program of the Tourette Association of America in partnership with the CDC. During tonight's webinar, we would be very happy to hear from you and include your voice in the conversation. You can ask questions or share comments using the question panel on the right side of your GoToWebinar player at any time. We will collect your questions and address them during the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. I would like to mention that funding for this webinar was made possible by our cooperative agreement with the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. The views expressed by speakers and moderators do not necessarily reflect the official policies of the Department of Health and Human Services, nor does the mention of trade names, commercial practices, or organizations imply endorsement by the U.S. government. It is my pleasure to introduce you to our speaker this evening, Dr. Kenneth Phelps. Dr. Phelps is an Associate Professor of Clinical Neuropsychiatry and Adjunct Associate Professor of Clinical Pediatrics at the University of South Carolina School of Medicine. Within this context, Dr. Phelps also serves as the Outpatient Psychiatry Clinic Director and co-lead for the Palmetto Health USC Tourette Center of Excellence. Dr. Phelps has special interest in neurodevent neurodevelopmental and neuropsychiatric conditions. He has also served as a trainer for the Tourette Association of America's Behavioral Therapy Institute since 2016. Without further ado, Dr. Phelps, please go ahead with your presentation. Thank you so much, Angela, and thank to our attendees um, for taking time out of your day to attend uh, this webinar. I'm really excited you're here, and please feel free to ask your questions because we're going to try to save some time at the end. As um, Angela mentioned, I'm a clinical faculty at uh, Prisma Health University of South Carolina here in Columbia, South Carolina, and I specialize in Tourette's and OCD and also relational health as a medical family therapist, and my background is in behavioral and developmental psychology. Uh, specifically working with children living on the autism spectrum, and I came to my work in Tourette syndrome uh, approximately 10 years ago. Uh, but my early research looking at working with children and families living on the autism spectrum really was working at uh, observing how kids and families can deal with an immense amount of stress, but also at the same time experience a lot of enrichment and growth in their life alongside some of those stressful conditions. So we've recently embarked, uh, myself and some colleagues in Florida have recently embarked on a small pilot study that's focused on resilience and growth amongst young adults who are living with Tourette syndrome. And we also look forward to pursuing more work looking at resilience amongst adults, uh, kids, and families who are living with Tourette's. And that's what we're here to talk about this evening. So first, um, I want to disclose that uh, my work with the Tourette Association of America, specifically, as you heard Angela mentioned, I've done a lot of work with the Behavioral uh, Therapy Institutes, sometimes referenced as the BTIs. And if there are any providers listening in, we would really encourage you to reach out to the TAA because this will allow us to have more CBIT providers to offer those sorts of services um, all around the country. So our objectives for today are to first define resiliency. And looking at how we develop resiliency, really through intrapsychic or personal psychological ways, as well as through interpersonal or relational frameworks. We're also going to identify what are the key factors in the development of resilience and growth, and some strategies that can be integrated into your life to enhance resilience, whether you're a family member, a child, or an adult who may be living with Tourette syndrome. So I want to start with a quote by Elizabeth Lucas. She is an Austrian therapist who was captivated by the work of Viktor Frankl. And as most of you may know, Viktor Frankl was an Austrian psychologist and Holocaust survivor who wrote the best-selling book, Man's Search for Meaning. And this quote really, I think, embodies a lot of what we mean when we say resilience, which Viktor Frankl wrote a great deal about, which is the forces of fate that bear down on a man and threaten to break him also have the capacity to ennoble him. In other words, the difficulties we face in life um, are certainly difficult, but also have the immense capacity to make us stronger as individuals. And that's what we're kind of unpack today. 
So what is resilience? Let's start with the definition. Resilience is the ability to withstand and rebound from adversity, emerging strengthened and more resourceful. Resilience is indeed bouncing back, but really it is defined by bouncing back with different insights and a tenacity that may not have existed had that person or had that family not gone through the struggle. So resilience is not a simple linear path. It's complex, it's dynamic, and it often involves some considerable emotional distress. So this visual up in the top right corner of your screen can really be a helpful representation of resilience. As it's listed here, it's applied to the stages of grief. And when we think about it as it pertains to tonight's talk, we're actually thinking about it more like the stages of adjustment, of adjusting to the ups and the downs and all of the round and rounds that go along with living with a chronic struggle. So if you look over to the left, it starts with things like loss and hurt, shock, denial, frustration, anxiety, and down towards the bottom, it's things like loneliness and guilt and isolation. I may deal with things like depression. And out of the other side, you see things like, you know, new relationships, new strengths, new patterns, helping others who may be in a similar circumstance. And what we know is that this is not a simple U-shaped curve, which is why on the left, it would say stages of adjustment, or in this case, stages of grief as applied to loss. But on the right, it's really my experience. And this is most of our experiences when we go through a really difficult life experience. We kind of jump all around in that. And that is in part what can help us build resilience is all the ups and downs that we must have to adjust to in life. But the good news is that resilience is not a trait that you have or you don't have at birth. Some of the early researchers on resilience did a lot of investigative work on the individual parts of resilience, and they looked at something called hardiness and trying to figure out why some people struggle profoundly and others seem to emerge strengthened from life struggles. However, what we've really learned in recent years and decades is that, yes, these individual factors have to be considered but really the wider family and the wider cultural system have to be considered. Resilience is something also we know that can be developed and that can be nurtured. We can develop it over time through our lived experience. So we often talk about resilience in these three different ways. And it's helpful to think about it almost like a tree that may exist in a strong storm. I live here in South Carolina, and so I want you to imagine almost like a hurricane blowing a tree around as a good visual. So the first thing we think about is often referenced as recovery. It's like when a strong wind blows the tree and the tree bends to accommodate that wind or else it'll break. But when the wind stops, the tree resumes its original upright state. So similarly, it's like a stress that disrupts a person's life or a family's normal state of functioning. But when the stressor passes or lets up, the person or family eventually resume their normal or pre-stressor level of functioning. And this would be akin to like buoyancy or bouncing back. The second is the idea of resistance. This is almost like a tree standing still, undisturbed in the face of a howling wind. So this could be a person who exhibits normal functioning before, during, or after a big stressor. And this would be akin to being seemingly unfazed through a significant disruption in our life. But really, for the purposes of tonight's talk, and when we study resiliency most of the time, we're often looking at this last one, which is reconfiguration. This is the wind blowing, and the tree does not simply make a temporary accommodation, but that leads to its resuming its normal shape as we talked about in the first example, but instead somehow the tree changes its shape. The reconfigured tree can accommodate prevailing winds, but it also makes the tree resistant to break in the future. 
So this is the capacity to rebound from adversity, strengthened and more resourceful. And this is gonna be our primary focus. In part, because we know that Tourette syndrome provides a host of challenges for youth, adults, and families who are coping. A couple that I wanna mention before we move on is, is first the chronic and unpredictable nature of Tourette syndrome. People often are dealing with things like, when will ticks worsen? How long will the waning of a severity last? And what will the future hold? And that's really notable because we know that anxiety tends to thrive and tends to grow in situations of uncertainty. The what if thoughts that many of us have when we're feeling anxious tend to really take root in the unknowns. Secondly, we know that Tourette syndrome and tick disorders are still so misunderstood and mischaracterized by our communities and by our cultures. And we know that resilience is inherently relational. And when we have safe people, safe spaces, we're able to more easily navigate something. So Froma Walsh is a leader in the family therapy world. And she references this quote in her 2016 book, Strengthening Family Resilience. It says, in the depths of winter, I found there was within me an invincible summer. No matter how hard the world pushes against me, within me there's something stronger, something better pushing right back. The undeniable personal strength of those living with Tourette syndrome and the determined patience to educate others around the world is what has continuously drawn me to uh, work in this field. And so I wanna introduce to you um, a model originally proposed by Rick Little of the International Youth Foundation, and he initially developed these four C's that you see listed, competence, confidence, connection, and character. And this was later expanded by Dr. Kenneth Ginsberg in his book published in partnership with the American Academy of Pediatrics, entitled Building Resilience in Children and Teens, Giving Kids Roots and Wings, which is now in its third edition. And Dr. Kinsberg added the contribution, coping, and control. So it would require far longer than our hour together to thoughtfully outline each of these C's you can see listed on your screen. But I'll do my best to integrate some of these C's through four focused areas I'd like to cover with you today. But if you'd like to learn more and read a lot more about these seven C's of resilience, I'd encourage you to look into Dr. Ginsburg text, Building Resilience in Children and Teens. But in the effort of time, these are gonna be the four uh, elements of resilience that we're going to unpack this evening. First, realistic optimism. Second, social support. Third, flexibility. And fourth, mindfulness. So we often say, oh, I'm a pessimist, or oh, I'm an optimist. And what we know is that pessimists tend to see things that are bad as potentially being permanent or universal. And they tend to be more likely to have what's called an external locus of control, meaning things outside of me need to change for there to be a difference. Where optimists are on the far other side, where they tend to see bad things as temporary, limited in scope, and tend to say, I can do a lot to change the situation. But there's actually a third option, and the third option is really common amongst people who are resilient. And it's often referenced as realistic optimism. And a realistic optimist is someone who has a future-oriented attitude and is generally confident that things will work out. And so by work out, that does not mean that problems will necessarily go away or evaporate, but rather they'll find the fortitude to cope and to traverse even the most challenging of circumstances. In other words, I don't exactly know what's ahead of me, but I'm gonna do my best to put one foot in front of the other and do my best to deal with what comes my way. So the person who's both realistic and optimistic is able to notice the problems and negative experiences in their life, but disentangle from this key phrase, unsolvable problems. 
And this aligns really with the serenity prayer that's often used by organizations like Alcoholics Anonymous, which was originally written by the American theologian um, Niebuhr. It says, God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Or in other words, what is within my control? What is outside of my control? And I'm going to try to control the controllables and lean into the discomfort. So this aligns with one of the C's I mentioned earlier, control. So if you're someone who tends to learn more with images like myself, I like the visual used by Dr. Hansen in his recent book entitled Resilient. This is an image of going for a walk in your mind, like you're walking next to a stream. And when you notice negative problems, which is kind of like debris, that doesn't enrich or make your walk any better. You can't move it necessarily, but you simply acknowledge it. There's the negatives, there's the debris, and do your best to notice and then keep walking. But when you notice a solvable problem or potentially positives on your mind's walk, you stop and fully pay attention to these internal experiences. So why is this important? What we know is that realistic optimists tend to have more successful careers, better relationships, better physical and emotional health, and even less markers of inflammation, which is something we tend to study more and more of the overlap between the medical and the psychological. So let me be clear that we absolutely do not encourage unrealistic optimism, because what we know is this would be akin to not acknowledging the problems, but rather putting on rose-colored glasses and, and telling yourself that everything will be okay. And this would lead to underestimating risk, overestimating one's abilities, and a really inadequate preparation for life. This realistic optimism is about controlling what can be controlled and making a concrete plan. So one helpful framework in thinking about realistic optimism is Dr. Barbara Fredrickson, who's at the University of North Carolina's Broaden and Build model. But before we jump into that, I wanted to first talk about one of my favorite movies, um, having three young children, called Inside Out. And if you look at the image below, you'll notice that there are five core emotions. Many of you who've seen the movie probably know, but it's fear, sadness, joy, disgust, and anger. And what you may notice about these emotions is that four tend to lean pretty heavily on the negative side, whereas one tends to lean more on the positive side. And this is actually the way our minds often work and our brains have been designed. Our minds tend to have a negative bias because thinking about negatives tends actually to protect us. If we were walking through the woods it would be way more helpful to remember the time we stepped on a snake rather than the time we stepped on a large stick. So we tend to remember negative memories as a feature of self-protection. So this is where Fredrickson's broaden and build model comes in. She studies people closely in her lab and has found that negative emotions like anger, disgust, or fear helps us survive by preparing us for danger. These emotions activate our physiology and actually narrow our focus to fight or flight. It narrows our focus to a threat. But one thing to remember is that, you know, our bodies are not designed for the 21st century stress. We were designed to encounter an immediate threat like a dangerous animal and then battle to fight or run to flight. But in the modern world, we actually don't get rid of our stress hormones as quickly because we don't often get to fight or flight because we know we can't. So for instance, it would be socially inappropriate to punch your boss or to run out of the building in the middle of a big stressful meeting. Instead, we usually sit there experiencing what we're experiencing and our stress hormones tend to circulate through our body for much longer than they would. And our focus narrows. However, positive emotions like joy, pride, love, tend to instigate creativity, flexibility, and inclusiveness. And rather than narrowing our awareness, 
they actually broaden our awareness and they encourage novel, valued, and exploratory thoughts and actions. So Dr. Fredrickson suggests that we really have to work to broaden our focus on meaningful and positive events because we're not wired to do so. And she writes about this in her books, Positivity, as well as her more recent book about how to supply the relationships in Love 2.0. And this is one difference between those who show high levels of resilience and those who don't. They tend to intentionally shift to emotions and events that are more controllable or that are more positive. So as we begin to think, how can we create more positive emotions by more positive events? So Dr. Hansen, who I mentioned earlier, who wrote the book Resilient, concurs with some of Dr. Fredrickson's ideas, and he actually wrote, our brains are like Velcro for bad experiences and Teflon for good ones. And he suggests we use this acronym called HEAL. The first part is activation. This means having a beneficial or positive experience. And for some of us, we may actually have to be really purposeful about creating a positive or beneficial experience. In the psychological research, we talk about scheduling pleasurable experience, or uh, pleasurable activities when possible. And we know that individuals who are depressed, which is a common comorbidity for those living with Tourette syndrome, tend to withdraw from enjoyable activities. And this is often because when we get downtrodden and feel negative, we're more likely to have thoughts like, yeah, I probably won't enjoy that anyway. It'll be more of a hassle to go. I don't feel like it. And this may be especially true for those who have to live with tics because they'd be more concerned because their tics during public outings may draw real discrimination from people in those settings. But the difficulty is that if we withdraw from most of our potentially pleasurable experiences, like a baseball game or dinner with friends or a school event, then our brain's negative filtering goes into overdrive and we tend to get less and less of a chance to actually experience pleasure. And one way to combat this is by creating the H up here, pleasurable activities, and by placing them on our schedule. And this is particularly helpful if it's something that builds competence, one of our other C's. We know that it's important for all of us, but especially for children with brains that are changing every day. Competence is not a general feeling like I can do it, but it's rather getting a sense of mastery or achievement at something. It could be a sport, it could be a musical instrument, it could be artistic work, but it's getting a sense that I can do this. And that leads to the next part of Dr. Hansen's HEAL model, installation, that after we experience that beneficial experience, we really need to stay with it fully. It's almost like rumination, but healthy rumination. And parents can do this for their children by talking out loud about how they may have had a stressful day, but they'll choose to focus on something that went well instead, in spite of the difficulty. So for instance, my wife and I in our house, often at the end of the day, we'll talk about the top of our day and the flop of our day. And in that, we'll try to model for our children that we can have really difficult and overwhelming experiences, but choose to shift our attention to things that we can control in the midst of that tsunami of stress. And this aligns with, in many ways, what television um, children's host Mr. Rogers said that his mother would often say when scary news appeared on the television. She would say, look for the helpers. In other words, looking for the good, the selfless, in the midst of chaos and disorder. Other ideas for enriching and absorbing the beneficial experiences around you might include things like a gratitude list or building agency by looking for times when you've already made a choice that impacted an outcome, where you are in some degree of control. I recently read this statement. It's almost like saying to yourself, I'm gonna look for times in my day when I am the hammer and life is the nail. When I feel like I am choosing something that's gonna impact an outcome in my life. And the reason this is important is it facilitates problem solving. It engages our prefrontal cortex, our thinking part of our brain, 
rather than the alarm system, the amygdala, the lower reptilian parts of our brain that can hijack our thinking. Um, and this is the value of realistic optimism. The second one we want to mention is social support. So we know that interdependence, depending on each other, is foundational and is protective. And we are inherently a social species. And just as avoidance tends to be the best friend of anxiety, isolation tends to be the best friend of depression. So we know that social connectedness and cooperation tends to activate reward centers in our brain, where rejection tends to activate areas of our brain that are actually linked with the same parts of the brain that trigger physical pain. This is why adolescents and adults who are dealing with a breakup often literally feel pain. And while we as parents would love to shield our children, I certainly fall in this category, we'd love to shield them from heartache. It's helpful for them to navigate these interpersonal challenges with some guidance rather than the incessant advice giving that can be so hard that we fall into. And the social stressors that we might encounter actually allow us to build some more of the C's I mentioned earlier. Character, to know what the right kind of connection the other C should feel like. Adolescents and young adults need these experiences because it gives them a chance to learn coping as well as to determine what will be desirable and undesirable in relationships in their life. But I was thinking about this and think, you know, there's something to this saying, you have to kiss a lot of frogs before you find your prince or your princess. And that doesn't work if we as parents go along and squash all the frogs and try to hand them a qualified partner because you don't get the same sense of resilience and learning than if you go through some of it yourself but we need uh, to know these social relationships are good for our mental health just like we need air for breathing and for um, physical health. We derive benefits of generosity and compassion from being around others. And we get another C, which is contribution. We get this through altruistically helping other people. So one important component and practical thing to think about of social support is finding healthy role models. And it's best to look in the natural environment or in the family when possible. However, you know, sometimes celebrities or thought leaders can act in this capacity. In the um, syndrome community, we could consider famous athletes like a soccer star Tim Howard or Olympic gold swimmer Anthony Irvin. And recently, a lot of the teenagers I've been seeing have been telling me about popular singer Billie Eilish. So why are role models important? So psychologist Emily Werner followed children were raised in really challenging situations. We call these ACEs um, or adverse childhood experiences in the psychological literature. These were kids who were being raised in households where there may be alcoholism, abuse, or mental illness. And she found that those children who went on to become productive, emotionally healthy adults found at least one person who truly supported them and was an admired role model. And it's best if the person has a one-to-one -one relationship with this model. So one way we try to do this here at our center in South Carolina is we've tried to bring back young adults with Tourette syndrome who are thriving and trying to ask them as 20 year olds to talk to the people we see here who are teenagers or younger children who might be living with tics. Because to build resilience, it can be most helpful to find role models that you can relate to if possible. It's also really important to find role models who have failed but kept going. They have shown resilience and they have shown grit. So for instance, one of my favorite role models growing up was Michael Jordan. And Michael Jordan once said, you know, I won the NBA World Championship six times but I missed over 9,000 shots. I lost 300 games and 26 times I had the game winning shot and I missed. 
I failed over and over again in my life, and that is precisely why I succeeded. So for those of you who have children living with Tourette syndrome, look for opportunities to highlight how people have struggled, maybe yourself, but kept persevering. Model it and talk about it out loud and give your children or your teenagers specific praise when you notice them exhibiting any steadfastness and steadfastness in doing something despite difficulty in achieving their immediate success. So secondly, it can be really helpful to bolster our social networks. And in a type of therapy that we call interpersonal psychotherapy, we call this image to the right an interpersonal inventory, sort of the bullseye. IPT or interpersonal therapy has been shown to help those living with a whole array of conditions, including depression and anxiety. And on this interpersonal inventory, we'd ask someone to place themselves in the middle and then the people who impact their mental well-being most near the center. And the further someone gets away from the center of the bullseye or the person, then the less they may impact their well-being. And then once it's complete, we tend to step away and ask ourselves, are there people on this inner circle or outer circle who are helping you develop resilience or mental dexterity? Are they helping you in your life? Do you need better boundaries with any of these people? Are there people on the outside that you'd really like to be on the inside? And are there people on the inside who might better be on the outside? As parents, you know, we often want to give advice, particularly to young people about their relationships. And this isn't limited to us as parents. As adults, we often give lots of unsolicited advice to one another. And one reason that we may wanna tread slowly in telling another person what to do with their interpersonal bullseye is that actually thinking it through themselves, maybe with some coaching or some dialogue, may help them build resilience. So instead of talking in chapters or lecturing as we can easily find ourselves doing, talking in sentences or bullet points may be important if any advice is given. Instead of giving too many directives, one helpful strategy is actually asking questions. Otherwise, you might end up falling victim to what we sometimes refer to as the Charlie Brown effect, which is the wah, 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 when too much of the you should do this or you should do that might be given. So I wanted to give you a quick example. So let's say um, we have a young boy named Connor, and Connor is living with Tourette syndrome, and he has a number of, quote, friends that tend to mock his tics, and it really seems to bother him. And Connor's parents could say, you know, you shouldn't be around people who are making fun of your Tourette's. I forbid you to be around James and Aaron anymore, and I'm going to call their parents, and I'm going to tell them that it's uncalled for. Or they could ask some questions and make some brief statements like, Connor, how are things with James and Aaron? Are, are you enjoying your time hanging out with them? How do they usually respond to your tics? Because I noticed the other day that they seem to be imitating your movements. And I just was wondering, is that hard for you? Have you ever said anything to them? And you know, even if you don't feel like talking to me about it now, I want you to know that you can always brainstorm ways to handle these situations with me. I love you unconditionally, and I'll always be here to bounce ideas off of, okay? So in the first situation, the parent may unintentionally plow the stressor out of the teen's path so they don't have to deal with it, which may actually in the end cause more stress. Additionally, you know, this may also plow out of the way the chance to build some resilience. But in the second, the parent took a guiding role and the teen was able to maybe think through the situation themselves. But don't get me wrong. Um, I sometimes laugh that my children are younger school aged and I used to recommend those behavioral charts with lots and lots of stickers until I had children of my own and said, oh, those are far too complica complicated. So if I'm giving another one of these talks, five or six years from now, they have other advice uh, because I know it can be so challenging for me, the families I work with. And there are certainly situations as a parent 
when you have to step in and purposely move someone out of your teen's interpersonal bullseye, especially peers that may be exposing your youth to dangerous experiences. And also, some youth actually may need more coaching and assertiveness than others. So the third thing I want to mention to you is this area called flexibility. So flexibility really means flexibility in self-talk and one of those C's named coping. So to be resilient, we need to be able to adapt uh, depending on what life throws us. To cope well, we typically need a degree of, of what's called radical acceptance in a type of therapy called DBT or dialectical behavioral therapy. Radical acceptance is about saying, I don't like everything about my life right now, but you know, it is what it is. I have to lean into this situation and I have to own it. And let me first say that this is really difficult and often follows that my experiences of coping or grief image I showed you earlier is that it is not a linear process. People move in and out of this in dealing with things in life. And it at times comes out as humor. So actually, a couple weeks ago, I was meeting with a young adult who lives with multiple complex tics, and he said to me, you know, Dr. Phelps, I've learned that everyone is going to look at me because I deal with these annoying tics. And what I've learned to do recently is just own it and kind of lean into it. And he was watching that comedian, Samuel Comro, I believe is how you say his name, and he said he had the thought, if I can laugh at some of these, then maybe this path won't be as hard. So what he found was that when he distanced and reappraised his situation, he could find another way to look at himself and his struggles. And he also decided that he wouldn't be completely defined by the alphabet soup that we providers tend to throw out, like, TS, ADHD, OCD, MDD, GAD. You know, instead he thought, I am a person with real struggles, just like everyone else. And everyone looking at me has their own struggles, but mine just happened to be observable. And what he was doing in part was he was beginning to shift his self-talk. So one helpful story to share about our internal dialogue comes from leading experts in the field of perfectionism. So it goes like this. Imagine you're learning to play a sport. So I coach um, my son's soccer team, so let's say soccer. And in the month of September, you'll have coach one. So your first coach you're gonna have is hypercritical in the month of September. This coach may look like this image you see on the right. This coach tells you every time you mess up on the field, often screams labels at you, you idiot or don't be stupid. And the coach has to give extensive corrections on even the most minimal errors. And this coach is so negative that it leaves you feeling downtrodden and useless. And in the month of October, you have coach two. And coach two is endlessly encouraging. And in October, it's really a nice departure from September in Coach One. And this coach gives you lots of universal and ambiguous praise. So Coach Two tends to say things like, great job, you know, I'm proud of you, good game. And this coach praises you so much that you almost begin to doubt the legitimacy of his statements. Finally, it's November and you have Coach Three. And this coach, you know, he or she takes an approach of guidance and feedback in November. The coach tends to tell you one specific thing to work on for the next week and one highlight from your play on the team, on the field. You know, this coach has a calm and matter of fact affect with a hint of positivity and honesty. And you end practice with these games waiting for feedback. Somehow this coach's feedback can pierce through your self-criticism and leave you feeling motivated, but actually not motivated to do your best, but rather, you know, put your consistent effort forward and be proud of what you left on the field. So the moral of this story is resilient people work hard at having coach three self-talk. They try to eliminate their critic, to talk back to their critic, 
to notice the critic, but to keep walking and to move beyond to the grandiose accolades, but instead to focus on their effort, to focus on their feedback, because we know that's where resilience can lie. So lastly, I want to spend our, um, our last moments here talking about mindfulness. And mindfulness has been used for a range of problems. Disorder. We know that um, mindfulness is about being aware. It's about being in the present, about being in the here and the now. And it's about taking an observing stance to one's environment. And really, in the end, being non-judgmental. So, you know, why might mindfulness be helpful for someone who would be living with Tourette's syndrome? So we know that mindfulness, uh, we believe, helps people have an increased attentional control and what's called a greater interoceptive awareness. So what does that mean? It just means that when you're mindful, when you're paying attention to your body and when you're paying attention to your environment, you may be better aware of premonitory urges, the feeling right before a tick, and you may be able to tune in to more of some of the things that may be pushing or pulling a tick around to make it worse or better in your environment. And we also know that individuals may have better distress tolerance. They may be able to kind of sit with that, dis that premonitory urge longer if they want to or if they're bothered by their ticks and want to do some things to manage them. We also know that mindfulness or being attuned to one's body helps with your overall physiological arousal and your um, emotional reactivity. So probably most importantly for our conversation today about resilience is we know that mindfulness helps build self-compassion and helps shift one's attitude to a more accepting place towards oneself. So I'm not going to mention too much around the research around mindfulness, but just to say that there's been a couple of recent studies, one in 2011 and one in 2015, where um, researchers are applying mindfulness um, to ticks and some of the things people live with alongside ticks. And this has been mostly utilized for adults. Um, and we know we have a mainstay of treatment, CBIT, which actually has been shown when you add some mindfulness components can be helpful for people. Um, we know the core part of CBIT, habit reversal training, in and of itself is very efficacious, and doing some additional components of mindfulness can be really helpful for a lot of people. But just doing the mindfulness-based stress reduction, there's some new research to say that this is helpful for some people. So in one study, about 58.8% of people, almost a little over half, had some significant improvement how they were feeling about themselves and in some of their symptoms by using some mindfulness strategies. So what does mindfulness mean? So this visual you see a lot. Um, and the first one is the idea of what life feels like without mindfulness. So by stimulus, what we mean by that is stress. So as we walk through our day, we encounter stressor after stressor after stressor. And very often we feel like we're in a space of, um, of the red zone or reactive mode. We're just reacting to the stressors in our lives that might cross our path. Where with mindfulness, the idea is that the stressor comes, many times we cannot change that stressor, but we take a mindful moment. And for some people, this might mean just checking in with themselves. This might mean taking a breath. This might mean taking a step away. And then we try to thoughtfully center ourselves for sometimes a matter of a second and respond to the stressor or stimulus rather than react to it, which is often referenced as trying to stay in the green zone of responding rather than reacting. So mindfulness, one question I will commonly get if I mention mindfulness is do we know much of what seems to be most effective for people living with ticks? And one thing I hear anecdotally from a lot of people um, I see who try to do some of the mindfulness strategies alongside some of the other techniques we do like um, competing responses is that often body scanning or stretching yoga walking those kind of practices tend to be a lot easier than just a seated meditation when they're living with ticks um, we also know that sometimes when we're dealing with strong emotions an example of this might be living with things like suicidal thoughts we'll sometimes talk about riding the wave of that really distressing experiences tend to come and go. 
And so it's almost riding the wave of those intrusive thoughts or those negative thoughts and riding it the whole way through um, as well. And lastly, I put down here, one thing we do in our family is we've designed like a little chill out corner, like some beanbag chairs or like a mindful space where um, kids or adults can go to just to chill out for a little while if they're feeling overwhelmed or overstimulated to know that there's a space to go just to kind of de-escalate and emotionally regulate. So um, the last bit of what I want to mention is a few more mindfulness strategies. First is labeling and observing thoughts. We know that when really distressing thoughts come into people's minds, resilient individuals tend to say to themselves very often, oh, there goes my anxious thought. You know, they tend to label that thought and label it for what it is. And we know that when you label a thought, it actually engages your prefrontal cortex. It engages that thinking part of your brain and gives you some, exist, uh, some uh, distance from that thought. And so just let it be and tell yourself, you know, it's going to go and then let in more positive experiences around, which is, you know, can be easier said than done. It takes real practice. We also know that many individuals um, talk about mindfulness through technology. Um, Calm is an app that I frequently use. Many individuals turn to things like Headspace or Chill. And there's plenty of YouTube videos as well of things like breathing um, and imagery. Uh, we also know that it can be really useful to say, where is my place of refuge? People who are building resilience tend to find ways to take breaks from the day-to-day -day chronic stress. And that might be playing with a pet, that might be drawing, that might be playing piano, but a variety of things just to have a moment to kind of recenter oneself in the midst of the day. And one other thing I'll commonly do, particularly when I work with, uh, with children and adolescents, is I'll validate that one of the hardest things, as I mentioned early in this talk with Tourette syndrome, is the uncertainty, you know, that we've, we've done some research to try to predict the course of this, but the not knowing can be so hard. But if we keep a long-term perspective, we know that at least for a lot of a lot of people out there, that they're going to have a reduction in their tics into their adulthood. But still, even if people still are dealing with really severe and incapacitating tics, people can find a way sometimes to grow as individuals in the midst of that struggle. So the APA or the American Psychological Association released a variety of guidelines um, in this document called The Road to Resilience, which is not specific to Tourette syndrome, but is around dealing with any kind of life difficulty. And I just wanted to mention a few of their recommendations as kind of adjunctively to what we mentioned in our top four things. First is to notice subtle ways in which you may already feel somewhat better when you're dealing with difficult situations to develop SMART goals. These might be goals that are very specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-bound. When you develop very small, discrete goals and you can check boxes or mark off a list, there's often that sense of satisfaction, like of mastery, like I got this done, a sense of competence around that. Instead of focusing on tasks that seem unachievable, saying, you know, what's one small thing I can accomplish today that helps me move even an inch in the direction where I want to go in my life. Some people will actually try to visualize or use imagery to see themselves doing what they want to do in their future. And lastly, you know, we know that self-care becomes so important. And so one way many individuals will build a sense of competency is through focusing on exercise or healthy eating. And that that's something that if individuals set the goal, let's say of walking a mile, if they, if they check that box, that can build a sense of, you know, in the midst of today's chaos, this is something I can control and feel good about myself for. So here's our key points from tonight. Um, First, resiliency is, is really all about experiencing suffering alongside strength, adversity alongside agency, and pain alongside pleasure. That These two things are, are really not dichotomies. They have the ability, the research literature tells us, to coexist. And they come and they go in sometimes rapid fashion. Number two is to build social support gain mental flexibility, and be really realistically optimistic. 
because we know those things can foster resilience and growth. And then lastly, you know, mindfulness can be integrated into our daily lives across settings. There's a lot of literature that supports the integration of mindfulness into schools. And we know it holds innumerable benefits for many individuals, not everyone, but for many in their physical and uh, their mental health. Thank you, Dr. Phelps. That was an excellent presentation. We're now going to begin the question and answer session for anyone who is um, has any additional questions for Dr. Phelps. As a reminder, you can still submit your questions through the question pane in your control panel. If we are unable to get to everyone's questions this evening, the Toronto Association has a full-time information referral staff who can answer your questions as well. If you email support at Tourette.org, or give us a call at 1-888-4-TOURETTE. So we don't have any questions yet. So let's wait a few seconds, see if anyone has any. So someone just asked if they can get an audio of the talk. Yes, this session was recorded. So after you close out within the next 24 hours, you should be getting an email that will take you to the, to the recording. If you don't, feel free to email webinars at Tourette.org and I'm happy to forward you the recording. It will also be living on our YouTube channel after this evening once it's been downloaded. So that's where you can find tonight's webinar as well as any other webinar that has been recorded. Okay, Dr. Phelps, we have a question. At what age would therapy for Tourette's or Tics be most helpful? Oh, thanks for that question. So um, one question I would have would be if we're talking directly about ticks or if we're talking about some of the things that individuals may be coping with alongside ticks and I'll try to answer it both ways. So if an individual is um, living with ticks and we're talking about CBIT, often what we're thinking about when we think about comprehensive behavioral intervention for ticks is, is the child really bothered by their ticks? Because we would actually only intervene if the child or teenager or adult is saying, these ticks really bother me and I want some help in trying to manage some of the symptoms that I'm having because I would love to be able to manage these ticks a little bit better. So we, we base that on when we might try to intervene. The initial trials of CBIT were used more for um, children who were in the pre-adolescent and adolescent and adult period, but certainly we found that CBIT can be efficacious and helpful for many younger children too. I see children as young as five or six or seven sometimes in our practice. They just may sometimes have a little bit harder of a time being able to be aware of their premonitory urges, um, but sometimes just learning at a young age that you know therapy doesn't have to be a, a scary thing that we know that it's a place we could talk about our feelings and how it feels to cope with having something like Tourette syndrome um, as well as it can be a place for many younger children we find ourselves working hard at anxieties and worries and learning how to boss back to some of their worries and also how to um, advocate for themselves. So if people are asking like, what are you doing? Or why are you doing that? That they can have a script and kind of role play with a safe person, how they could respond to some of the inquiries from other people about their tics. And so often with younger children, parents are more heavily involved, parents, grandparents, or caregivers. And the older a child or teenager gets, a parent would still need to be involved, but maybe less active in some of those conversations. They might be more involved in a debrief with the um, therapist or psychologist or, or other, other provider involved. Great, thank you. We have a few more questions. How do I tell my seven-year-old son about his new diagnosis? Is he too young? I know he would hate to be seen as others as different. Oh, it's a, that's a fantastic question. So, um, so I, I'm a big proponent of um, sharing that information, but I think it would be really um, helpful to also 
think about who are the medical providers or, or other providers who may have given um, that diagnosis because they also know your child and you may be able to just schedule a separate meeting with them to also kind of think it through and role play it some with them because there may be some real specific recommendations as it pertains to your child specifically. Um, but in general, my daughter's eight at home, so I can sort of think about a seven or eight year old as I would say, um, you know, buddy, we went to see Dr. Smith the other day. And one thing I wanted to mention to you is that um, sometimes boys and girls blink their eyes or clear their throats and, and we just call those ticks. And Dr. Smith is a doctor who helps kids with their brains and helps know why kids might do things like that. And we know that sometimes your brain just has a little hiccup and sometimes you might clear your throat or blink your eyes. And that's something we actually call a tick. And the thing to know about that is if it's not bothering you, then what we're going to do is we're just going to ignore it, right? Because there are so many other great things about you that we can really focus on, like you're great at soccer and you're great at math and, and you're number one, just a really kind guy. But if Dr. Phelps, hold on everyone. We had a slight issue. He, we lost his audio. Hold on one second. Dr. Phelps. Hey, Angela, I'm here. I didn't know if I popped off or something. I think my connection messed up. Yeah, you did. We lost you. <laughs> I don't know where you lost me in my dialogue, so I don't know if I should start all over the beginning or what to do. Um, well, we heard most of it, I think. Okay. It was good, just good. for like 20 it, seconds. I would keep it positive. I would keep it, you know, focused around the, the strengths of the child, and this is something that they're living with, but it's certainly not their identity, and I would be brief and perhaps talk with the medical provider or, or person who did the diagnosis, because they may also have some additional points pertinent to the, the child in particular. Great. Sorry okay. about that. I That's changed my okay. mind today. I <laughs> you're still there. Tried to log me off, so. Okay, so we have a, a couple other questions. If you reduce anxiety, won't that help reduce ticks? And I have two parts. She asked another question. And does talk therapy work to reduce ticks, in your opinion, or CBIT only? Okay, well, um, great questions. So, um, I will say that if I have someone who presents to treatment and they have moderate or severe anxiety, uh, we will often start by working on some of their anxiety symptoms. And for many people, as their anxiety comes down, we will also see an improvement in tick-related symptoms. The, um, the exception to that is if a lot of the anxiety is about the ticks. So if the individual may be having a lot of thoughts um, that are like, these ticks aren't going to get better, or I can't manage these, or other people are going to judge me, if there's a lot of anxiety about the ticks, sometimes giving someone some degree of management of their ticks, if they fall in that group that they really get some good benefit from CBIT, then as they may be able to manage their ticks a little bit better, then we know that uh, their anxiety will come down. So sometimes it's figuring out kind of chicken or egg, um, but often kind of a good rule of thumb we use as treatment providers is if a child is dealing with a lot of anxiety, we'll often work with that child and family of going after some of the anxiety symptoms first. Um, talk therapy, there are a lot of different types of therapy. I mentioned actually some of them in today's talk. Probably the most widely used and most evidence-based form of therapy for an anxiety problem um, would be uh, not CBIT, but CBT, or Cognitive Behavioral Therapy. Um, and Cognitive Behavioral Therapy is a tried and true approach that I use and most therapists and psychologists will lean on, which helps people look at their thoughts and respond to their thoughts 
and look at the validity and utility of their thoughts at the same time of trying to learn some new behavioral strategies. Um, and so we know that CBT can be really effective for anxiety, depression, and most other um, mental struggles that we may have. We, um, we know that, that interpersonal therapy, which I mentioned today, can be actually really helpful if someone's dealing with a lot of um, like social struggles. So an individual is having a lot of peer difficulties and having problems in the family system. And so it allows them to kind of role play and think through some of those relationships. Um, when we talk about just talk therapy, uh, if we're talking about supportive therapy where someone goes in and get some education and get some support from a provider. Actually, that's what um, CBIT was compared to in the research trials. And um, CBIT was above and beyond more efficacious than uh, just a supportive conversation. But I would say for some people, you know, they're gonna get some significant benefit from that as well too. Uh, you know, I often will say that all of us wanna be seen and wanna be heard and wanna be valued. So definitely the type of therapy is important, but but equally so is finding a provider that you feel like gets it, understands Tourette syndrome, more importantly, understands you or your child or your family, and is willing to kind of work at that. Great, thank you. All right, we have a few more questions. Do you want to take the time to answer them now? Yeah, sure, that's fun. Okay. Can therapy help teach mindfulness or breathing techniques to children around seven, year, seven or eight years old? if they're not yet ready for CBIT, particularly interested for a child with no comorbidities? Yeah, um, so, you know, what I would think about that is the, the couple small mindfulness studies that have been done have been done primarily with adults, in part because it's asking a lot of a seven-year-old um, to, to really engage in a whole lot of mindfulness um, in the traditional kind of meditative sense. It would be a lot to be asked to sit and kind of breathe and center oneself. But I think if a child um, is, is interested, there are lots of experiential ways we try to integrate mindfulness. So one thing a parent could do, and certainly I do at home with my kids, is to try to model this so they will at times see me meditating or, you know, as we're going for a walk in the neighborhood to the park, I'll just say, oh man, when I go for walks, I really like to notice things that are just like pretty amazing in nature. What do you see that's pretty amazing? So you can just like model and have conversations that bring you to the here and the now, like what's in your environment? What do you notice? What do you smell? What do you see? What do you touch? And then praising the child for really staying in the here and now and, uh, and doing their best to kind of um, manage the situations around them. And so if anything, I would just try to integrate in some of those mindfulness techniques in the day-to-day -day life of the child um, can, be a, can be a really helpful um, strategy for a lot of, uh, for a lot of kids um, as well. Great. Okay, next question. How true is the idea that they will just grow out of it or the tick motions? Uh, for the what? Say that last part again? The tick motions. Oh, for the so ticks. How, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. How, how, true how true is the idea that they will just grow out of it or yeah. the, aka the tick motions? Gotcha. So I think that um, one thing that there's been some work to do is a lot of um, pediatricians will say, you know, if a child just has a simple tick, they'll say, you know, most kids will end up just having a tick and will, over time it'll be transient and it'll come and it'll go. But one thing um, we know is that for a lot of kids that won't happen. And so we know that uh, ticks tend to follow a course, not always, but in many cases where they come on around the ages of um, four or five or six or seven, they tend to worsen for many children around the age of um, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, kind of pre puberty going into the hormones of puberty. And then for a, a good number of people, when they go into their late adolescence, um, they'll have either an improvement in their symptoms that's pretty substantial. Um, or the ticks will go away pretty um, significantly. However, there's been some recent research, and I was just with a group of people at the um, Treating Tourette Together Symposium, where we were talking a lot about CBIT, that actually many adults who may have had Tourette's in their childhood may still live with ticks in adulthood, but the ticks just may be less impairing. Now there, of course, as a group of people as they move into adulthood, that their, um, their ticks still remain quite impairing and we we always want to make sure we are recognizing and acknowledging that group because they need 
our help and our attention just as much as as anyone does. But we know that um, the number that's been thrown out at times is 70, 80 percent of people are going to have an improvement in their ticks um, or they're going to go significantly down and be, be relatively undetectable by anybody in the natural environment. Um, but we hate to sort of throw concrete numbers because these are coming out of research studies with certain very specific populations that have been studied. But the prognosis for a lot of people is quite good. Great. So we're going to do one more question, and then um, there are a few extras, but just to be wary of your time, I will forward them along to you, and then you can connect with people after the fact. Um, mm -hmm. If anyone has any additional questions out there, please feel reach out to the Tread Association. So the last question. I am researching a psychologist for my son. I don't see Tourette syndrome as part of their areas of expertise. Do you have any guidelines? He experiences anxiety and extreme separation anxiety. Yeah, so I think that um, one thing that I am never offended by, and I think it's it's a great thing for parents or guardians um, or caretakers to do, is to interview your providers and just for a few minutes and like to actually call and see if they will answer, like how long have you been doing this work? Have you had anyone you've seen before who's lived with, um, with ticks? If they haven't seen anyone who has lived with ticks or Tourette syndrome, um, one thing you could ask is have they treated individuals who um, had skin picking or hair pulling or some other conditions that we may use habit reversal type techniques with, um, but it would be different in the way we might implement it. Um, I would just ask about how long they've been in practice um, and ask for recommendations from friends and family. I know the Tourette Association, to kind of give a last plug, has a database of individuals across the country that have attended our BTI workshops. And so even if that person um, you connect with and is real experience in anxiety, um, doesn't have a whole lot of experience in Tourette's, I know the TAA and we're working really hard to train people around the country. So you as a, a parent or, um, or patient yourself could advocate for them attending one of the BTIs um, and getting the certification or the, the certification certificate of completion and really um, that's how a lot of people get into doing this work because they have a couple cases where they really want to learn more about how to help the Tourette community. Wonderful. Thank you so much again Dr. Phelps for a great presentation and answering all the questions. This is all the time that we have for our webinar this evening. Once the webinar is closed you'll receive a survey on the presentation and we would really appreciate it if you would complete that and provide your feedback. We will also, you will also receive a follow-up email within 24 to 48 hours with a link to view a recording of tonight's webinar. Additionally, the webinar will be posted on the Tourette Association YouTube channel for those who are unable to participate today. We encourage you to reach out to us on social media about this webinar or for any other ideas and suggestions you may have. On behalf of the Tourette Association, thank you again for joining us and taking the time to view our presentation. Have a great night, everyone.